Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. We're going to continue where we left off yesterday. We were looking at uh, verses 27 and 28. Well, actually, basically 25 to 29 in Daniel chapter 11. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Uh, dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful uh, for the time that we have this morning once again to open your word. And we need you as our teacher. We know, Lord, that we have much to learn and um, many things that need to be corrected in our understanding. And so we ask your Holy Spirit to reveal these things to us, to teach us individually and as a group. And we pray for one another. Uh, thank you uh, for this opportunity again. And we ask for your care and we ask for your presence. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Okay, so um, so yesterday we were going through uh, these verses and uh, we were addressing part of uh, Swearingen's ideas that didn't really fit in. So we're still not fully decided on how to understand this, but let's just go back and review. And Stephen's here. Now, Stephen, before we begin, is there anything that you, you need to point out that we've been doing wrong? There was a few things that I thought mm -hmm. you were doing that kind of is kind of new and it's just uh, I'm not I'm not too sure how valid it would be. But to me it okay. just seems a bit ar arbitrary. Okay. So that's why I like you. You you're you're more uh able to point out where I'm wrong and correct me. So but sometimes, you know, it's uh you help me, you know, really explain things better. Even if, even if I am right, not everybody's going to understand it. So, um, but let's go, let's go back and just review this. So we're going to start at verse 25. So we were addressing this whole idea that this is pagan Rome under Octavian. He's the king of the north and he's going to stir up his power and courage against the king of the south. And that's going to be Egypt under Mark Antony. Right. Don't worry right now about the present truth application. We're just trying to get the historical application. So this is going to be a dealing with this battle of, of, of Actium, right? That's what this whole, and you would agree with that, that this is, is sort of a repeat and enlarge, right? That it's going back and explaining an earlier detail in verse 24, dealing with the, the period of even for a time, right? Yeah, Stephen, the, you, the time there. Yeah, the, the time there mentions the appointed time again. I think later yes. on. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to talk in about an appointed so, time. Uh, yeah, so uh, you're asking if connected that to the same time in verse 24. Yeah. Yeah. So what I have there, like, B shall be at the appointed time. I mean, obviously, we're dealing with the end is not the Battle of Actium, which it looks like it is in my notes. The end is actually uh, the appointed time. The end shall be at the appointed time. The end is going to be 3.30, right? That's the yes, way that's how I would understand it. Yeah, and that's how I understand it too. So when we're talking about the appointed time, it's going to be the end. So probably we should put that in a different spot. That's that's in verse 27. So so when we get there, we'll, we'll deal with that. But the idea here is that this is an expansion of that uh, even, um, what, what's the word again, uh, even for a time, right? So the 360 years, and then, and so then they're going to go back and deal with that earlier history, because they've already come to the diaspora, and, you know, all the way up to 508. But now they're going to go back. So this repeat and enlarge, you agree with that. So, so when they go back, they're going to go back to Octavian. So this battle between the king of the north and the king of the south is not a battle between Greece. It's not a civil war in Greece anymore. This is now Rome that is now the king of the north uh, defeating the king of the south, which is Egypt. Right? You agree with that? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> now, we also have this uh, forecasting of his devices, where they shall forecast devices against him. And, of course, that ties us to uh, verse 24 again, right? 
So Rome is the one that forecasts its devices. Yes. And then what about the part dealing with, because we, we discussed this before, the feeding of the portion of his meat. And when I was looking in this history and it, dealing with the Battle of Actium, uh, the way that uh, Octavian won that was by stopping the grain supplies from Egypt to Cleopatra and Antony and their army. And their army. Right. So does, does that make sense? That well, how army... would he do that? I'm just saying. Well, how did they do it? it... They did it by, by interrupting the supply of grain by cutting off uh, the ports. So so the reason why Antony and Cleopatra actually went into the Battle of Actium is because uh, their army was beginning to rebel because they were starving. So they were forced into the battle at that time. And then what happens is he's going to turn against uh, Antony once he leaves, him and Cleopatra leave. Mm -hmm. But but that is not Egypt, the source of grain. Right. So Egypt is the source. So that's why it says, um, uh, yea, they that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him. So that's the the portion of his meat. That's Antony's meat or the South's meat. Uh, they that feed of the portion of the meat, that is his army, shall destroy him, Antony, and Octavian's army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. So that to me describes what happens, the, the strategy of Octavian in order to defeat uh, Antony and Cleopatra. So that's the way I interpret that. Do you have any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I can't really get the logic of it because I'm saying that his army, whatever, is there in Egypt and they're being, they have the food already in Egypt. So I don't see how Octavia... The, the army's not in Egypt. The, the army's in Actium. I, I thought you were saying that this year Battle of Actium is in, in response to this here. No. Originally, originally, I was trying to use I, that. I was thinking that until I started reading the history. So when you read the history, so what ends up happening is Antony and, Cle- Antony and Cleopatra, they go to Actium. They they build up an army there. They want to fight against Octavian, and they decide to do this in Greece, right? And, right, okay. But they need this supply of grain from Egypt in order right. to feed their army. And what Octavian is going to do with his general, I can't remember the guy's name, who, who's actually running the fleet. But the guy who's who's running the fleet, the admiral, I guess he'd be, he ends up cutting off this supply of grain. So so Antony and Cleopatra can't feed their army. And that's mm-hmm. why they end up being defeated. And that's partly why the army and navy are going to, once Antony and Cleopatra leave, um, they're just going to become loyal to Octavian. Well, there was other things. There was the inexperience of the sailors. Mm-hmm. I think uh, Octavian, Octavian sailors were more experienced, even though they were less yeah. in number. And they also had a genius commander. I just can't think of the guy's name, the admiral, the guy running the fleet. Um, uh, I'm just terrible with names. But there, the, anyway, the guy who was running the fleet, basically Octavian's right-hand man as far as um, that goes. So if somebody can find that out, what the guy's name was. But that's why they lose the Battle of Actium, right? And then it's going to say, and both these kings' heart shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table. So this is going back earlier again, right? So it's going to deal with the Battle of Actium, but then it's going to go back to when they made these false alliances, and then it's going to say um, they make these agreements, they wouldn't last, and yet the end shall be at the time appointed. So the end wouldn't be the defeat in 31 BC, the, the, right? That's that's actually the beginning, okay? And then shall he, Octavian, later Caesar Augustus, uh, return into his land with great riches, and his pagan Rome's heart shall be against the holy covenant So here this can't possibly be Octavian and shall return and and shall do in return to his own land. So 
So there's still things we have to sort out. But you, do you get a better idea of how how I was looking at this? Um, well, so just uh, Dwight has a comment there saying it's Marcus Agrippa is the name of the general. Yeah, Marcus Agrippa. Yeah, that's the guy's name. Right, okay. And um, my initial thought is that they shall forecast the devices against him. So that's talking about Rome. And then yeah. it says, yea, they that feed of the portion of his meat. So I'm still thinking that's still Rome, because Rome was basically being supplied to food from Egypt. Yeah, and that's what we talked about before. Now, if we did it that way, they that feed of the portion of his meat, well, who's his? Who's so, meat? Well, that would, so I'm thinking the they is Rome's army or Rome, and then he or they is, is Egypt, the king of the south. So you're just saying that the Roman army that's feeding off of the grain from Egypt is going to destroy Egypt? Well, basically, Rome was being supplied a lot of, up, up until maybe right. that time anyway. Yeah, and that's what that's so, what we thought originally. So that's what we thought originally. Now, as far as the word yay there, I'm not sure particularly why they put that there, you know, because there is no yay in in the you know in the verse. Um, so it just it starts with this yay. I'm trying to see what what the forms of this is in Hebrew. Yeah, sometimes it does, these translations sometimes don't make sense based on what I see in the Hebrew here. Yeah, because the idea that they have do mischief, right? and then shall he return to his land. Yeah, I don't know why they put yay. I can't see. It's just simply they that eat the portion of his meat shall. So it's just they that eat the portion or provision. The, the word in Hebrew is uh, pot bag. And then Shabar shall destroy. They shall destroy. It, you know, I don't, I don't know why they put yay. Because to me, that's yay is like connecting that thought with the forecast devices against him. So I'm not sure. They should just have uh, they that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him, and his army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. So, so I'm not sure why they're trying to connect it with this word yea. So I, I wouldn't connect the two. Like I wouldn't just say that it flows from that uh, phrase. For they shall forecast devices against him. So I'm not sure. Okay, so the forecasted devices. But what what is it that you see about this forecasting of the devices? Because it's it's going to mention in verse 24 as well. So what's the significance there? Verse 24 and 25. Yeah, I think it's more like planning, setting aims, coming to achieve domination. Okay. So you mentioned the forecast of his devices. Um, they shall forecast the devices, and then. Against him, yea, they that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him. So why are you connecting those two? Just because of the word yea? Initially, it was. It just seems to be talking about Rome, in a sense. Yeah. Okay. I okay. think so. But, but I'm not an expert in the Hebrew, so. Well, there's just nothing. Yea is not in the Hebrew. So it it just. But yeah, even, it, even, even if it's not there. Is it, is it still not potentially relate to Rome as being they? No, that's what I'm trying to say. Because we know about Hebrew that you can't just follow the pronouns like we do in English, right? So that that's the one the one thing that people always make a mistake of. So you can't just say, well, it's him, and and also you got him and they. So the they is a plural, the him is a singular, and and so. You know, so it's it's not as simple as just like reading it in English. So, so we know he stirs up his power and his courage against the king of the south. So the, he is the king of the north. That's Rome. Obviously, it has to be Rome coming against the king of the south. Um, but can he we, shall. We, what's that? To say that it's Mark Anthony's army that destroys him seems to be somewhat strange to me. I, I okay. think it would be more like R Rome. Rome is really the. I know he killed himself, but it's Rome's victory. It's, it's Rome's success. 
So you're you know, saying that, yeah. So you're saying the idea that those that feed of a portion of his meat shall destroy him. You're saying that the fact that uh, his army turns against him in the end, because that's why he's because remember his his army is going to join with with Octavian when Octavian comes ultimately and destroys Egypt, right? Because yes, right. So so that's what ends up happening. His army and his navy uh, turn against Antony, and in the end, right? That's not at the Battle of Actium itself, but later, that's going to end in the defeat of of Mark Antony. Right, because he loses his army, right? So now he's just retreated to Egypt. He believes his army is going to, to still be there and his navy. He doesn't really, he doesn't even know that it's a defeat, the Battle of Actium. It's just that Cleopatra leaves. So, you know, he jumps off the boat that he's on, swims, uh, um, and to some other boat and then gets, somehow gets back with Cleopatra. And he's not even really sure whether you know, Cleopatra actually was abandoning him on purpose, like history doesn't know that, or whether it was something that they had planned. So there's a lot of uncertainty about what actually happened. But when when they're back in Egypt, he still believes that his army is going to be his army, and it's not, right? It's going to join with Octavian. So that's why they destroy him. So this is just saying, basically, those that he was feeding, they're they're going to... Uh, turn against him. And then when it says his army shall overflow and many shall fall down slain, that's not talking about Antony's army, that's talking about Octavian's army, or Rome's army, actually, more particularly. Does that make sense? I mean, I don't know which particularly is the best interpretation. The other one is the one that I held before, right, that it was Rome's army that was feeding with the portion of his meat. But you had actually told me that this wasn't going to be later until Egypt actually was uh, the grain supplier for 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 Rome. Well, that's I did, yeah, I looked into that, and uh, if it was actually before, if it was from what I from the notes that I found from Wikipedia, mm-hmm. that uh, even, even before Rome took Egypt. Egypt was a source of grain for the citizens of Rome to feed the nation there. Yeah, and that's what I thought. I just went by what you had said. So then I started to look at it in a different way. And then I thought, well, maybe this makes more sense. Especially once I started looking at the history and about the fact that his army turns against him because of the grain supply being cut off. So, So either one is possible. But we're going to have to decide that at some point, which one is correct. Okay, so those are the things that I thought you probably would have comments on. Now, you would agree, I think everybody can agree, that when it goes back to both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, which is talking about their personal ambitions, and they speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. So one thing we can say is that this is talking about their their agreement to work together, but ultimately it's not going to prosper, right? So this is going back. It's, it's repeating and enlarging and then saying, for yet at the end shall be at the time appointed, and that's going to be in 330. So, so why does it point to the end of this and reference when they speak lies at one table? Why is this important? So I know I got to change that in the in the notes where I put the Battle of Acting. You know, partly this has to do with Swearingen's where he puts things. So, that, so the time appointed, and I'm going to get this out. So even when we deal with it, him destroying Antony, so he's going to commit suicide later in Egypt. When does he specifically uh, do this? There's a. I mean. It, uh, I studied a lot into this this history, so it's 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 actually very, you know, there's a lot of detail, and it's not as simple as as what we have there. So so he's gonna he's gonna die August first in 30 BC. So you got the Battle of Actium in 31 BC, so he's gonna die a year later. So 
It's not just like he loses the Battle of Actium. And he doesn't even know he lost the Battle of Actium um, initially, right? So we have him, uh, so he can commit suicide later in Egypt. Okay, so I must, I need to maybe do change this. Um, so Antony commits suicide later in G- Egypt. How does that, how does that go exactly? So we, we know that Egypt is going to be defeated and, and there's this whole thing where Cleopatra gets locked up in this temple. And um, Antony comes because he believes that Cleopatra has uh, either killed herself or something like that. So she's going to commit suicide as well. So she died either on the 10th or the 12th of August. And Mark Antony dies on the 1st of August. And she poisons herself. But I'm just going to go here. I'll read it. And we can discuss this a little bit. How we're going to fit this in. Okay. So... <clears throat> so we got Cleopatra. She she's 39 when she dies, right? Some people popular belief is that she allowed herself to be bitten by an asp, an Egyptian cobra. But the writers Strabo, Plutarch, and Cassius Dio say she poisoned herself using either a toxic ointment or by in- introducing the poison with a sharp implement such as a hairpin. Anyway. So modern scholars debate, debate the, the validity of ancient reports involving snake bites as a cause of death and whether she was murdered. Right. So there's obviously lots of modern theories about what actually happened. Right. But um, I usually stick with history better than revisionism. So committing suicide allowed her to avoid the humiliation of being paraded as a prisoner in a Roman triumph celebrating the vic- military victories of Octavian, who had become Rome's first emperor in 27 BC, to be known as Augustus. So it doesn't really say, okay, there's the prelude. So that would be part of this. So following the first triumvirate and assassination of Julius Caesar, so this is going to go back way back to 44 BC, right? We get this uh, uh, Emilius Lepidus, Mark Antony, and Octavian are going to be elected as triumvirs to bring Caesar's assassination, assassins to justice. So we went through that history. And so they have this, uh, the triumvirate. So then we have the Battle of Actium in the Abrasian Gulf in Greece in 31 BC. Cleopatra and Antony retreated to Egypt to recuperate and prepare for an assault by Octavian, whose forces grew larger with the surrender of many Antony's officers and soldiers in Greece. After a long period of failed negotiations, Octavian's forces invaded Egypt early in 30 BC, while Octavian captured Pelusian near the eastern borders of the Ptolemaic Egypt, his officer Cornelius Gallus marched from Cyrene and recap and captured Peritonium to the west, although Antony scored a small victory over Octavian's worn out troops as they approach Alexandria's hippodrome. Yeah, so I know they put it as an emphasis, but the thing is that so I'm just commenting on Angela's comment. So often Ye is in the text, but here it doesn't make sense to put Ye. Right, that's all I'm saying. So it's just something the translators added, probably of how they understood the text itself. Okay, so with Octavian's forces in Alexandria, Cleopatra withdrew to her tomb, which is which is actually a temple, and uh, with her closest attendants, and had a message sent to Antony that she had died by suicide. Antony ordered his slave Eros to kill him, but instead Eros killed himself with his sword. In despair, Antony stabbed himself through the stomach with a sword, inflicting a fatal wound. In Plutarch's telling, Antony was still alive as he was carried into Cleopatra's tomb, telling her of his dying in his dying words that he would die honorably and that she could trust a certain Gaius Proculeus on Octavian's side to treat her well. Um, this same uh, Proculeus used a ladder to breach a window of Cleopatra's tomb and to detain her inside before she could have a chance to burn herself to death, along with her vast treasure. Cleopatra was allowed to embalm Antony's body before she was forcibly, forcefully ex- escorted, escorted to the palace, where she eventually met with Octavian, who had also detained three of her children, Alexandria Helios, Cleopatra Silene, Selene the second and Ptolemy Philadelphus. As related to Livy in her meeting with Octavian, Cleopatra told him candidly 
I will be not led in a triumph. Okay. So, I mean, sometimes some of this history, we're not, there's disagreements about some of the details. Uh, but both of them are going to end up committing suicide. So they have two different dates for her death, either August 10th or August 12th. And we have August 1st for um, Antony. So that's going to be in connection with, and that's in 30 BC, in connection with uh, this battle or this uh, the Roman armies coming in. Now, as far as, so I don't know much about the battle itself. So is, is there a name for, for this, you know, fall of Egypt? I don't know what we would call it. So it's the Roman, the last war of the Roman Republic. So that's going to be Rome's rule over Egypt in 30 BC. Battle of Alexandria. Yeah, there, that would be it. Okay, July 1st to July 30th, 30 BC. Between the forces of Octavian and Mark Antony during the last war of the Roman Republic. So they had the Battle of Actium, preceded that. Okay, so, so why do we mark 31 BC instead of 30 BC for the defeat? of Egypt. Why do we mark the Battle of Actium and not the Battle of Alexandria? Anybody? Is it not just because we're going by Uriah Smith? Well, okay, why does Uriah Smith choose the Battle of Actium? I'm just saying, what's the logic behind it? Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, because we could argue, you know, if we use 30 BC, we could still say it's 360 years. You know, it just would be an inclusive count. Yeah, I think uh, it was brought to guest attention before this year, 3130 BC, which one's right. And uh, I think he sort of had mentioned that, that the 360 still applies. Oh, who, who said that? Jeff? That's in my understanding, yes. I think Jeff, someone had brought this year up to Jeff. Okay. About 30 BC being natural date, and I think he sort of Okay. So justify the 360 aspect. Okay. So, um, right. So it would still be 360. But uh, what would be the case? Why would we choose the Battle of Actium? Do we have any other reasons uh, that we would choose the Battle of Actium rather than the Battle of Alexandria? So, you know, and it's, it's, so it's going to go from, you know, July 1st and then they say to July 1st. 1st to 30th, it doesn't go to the 31st, I'm not sure why. And then on August 1st, you're going to have Mark Antony uh, commit suicide. Do we have any, like, is there some symbol with the Battle of Actium that would, I mean, we've already looked at the fact it's 31 BC, but are there symbols attached to this battle that are clearly marked in the scriptures? So, So one is, if you look at what's here, he shall stir up his power, his courage against the king of the south with a great army. And the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army. Is that true in 30 AD or 31 AD or 30 BC or 31 BC? Because when does Mark Antony have, you know, a, a, a apparent military advantage? Yeah, well, I think it's more the decisive battle, I think. Yeah. And, and it also, this would be describing more the Battle of Actium, not the Battle of Alexandria. Because basically he loses at the Battle of Actium, doesn't realize it. And, and in 30 uh, BC, it's basically he's, he just, uh, he ultimately gets defeated, but he's on a complete retreat because of the Battle of Actium. Now we'd also fit in then dealing with uh, the army turning against him as well, if we're going to take uh, this idea that they that for the feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him. If that's going to be the way that I understand it, um, as opposed to a more traditional way of understanding that. But I would think we still need to put the battle of Actium here. But that, that becomes what's being described here fits more with the battle of Actium. And any other thoughts on these two verses, 25 and 26, as far as the historical application? Okay, I'm just going to put uh, the date here. So when it says uh, his Octavian's army shall overflow and many shall fall down slain, should we have Octavian here or should we just have Rome? Like, is this talking particularly about 
the Battle of Actium when it comes to this overflowing, because the overflowing usually refers to the Sunday law. So, and we had the overflowing earlier, dealing with the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, as you were asking earlier about this, as far as the historical application, Mm -hmm. I agree that Antony's army is dependent upon Egypt for grain, but isn't Rome actually also dependent upon Egypt for grain? Yeah. Yeah, they are, but they're going to cut off that supply of grain to Mark Antony's army, which is why they end up winning the Battle of Actium. Okay. Right. And that that's why Antony's army in the end is defeated, because most of his army actually turns to support Octavian. So that would that would explain why it talks about they that for feed of the portion of his meat. Because we have to ask the question, why are they mentioning this in particular? I mean, there's lots of different ways you could describe Rome's army. But if you're going to talk about uh, an army that had been dependent upon this grain and it has been cut off, that would make a lot more sense in putting that verse there. Just from a historical application approach, because it is part of that history. It would just seem odd to, uh, I mean, maybe there's, a, maybe there is a reason to describe why it's, it's Rome that's, that's, uh, feeding of a portion of the meat of Egypt, the food coming from Egypt that's going to destroy Egypt. Maybe, maybe there's a logic there too. So, and any, any, any thoughts on that? I'm just, you know, at, at the outset, I was responding to your, your question. Mm-hmm on the historical application and I'm looking at several other things that that have been being addressed throughout this study. Okay, so the one of the other things is when it says um, and his Octavian's army shall overflow and many shall fall down slain. Uh, this can't be referring to the Battle of Actium itself because that, that doesn't happen I mean unless you're going to say when they they surrender. But but what's going to end up happening is that's going to happen later in 30 AD that you're going to have uh, really the defeat of Egypt. But the question is, is this even talking about under Octavian? Is this talking about something that happens even later? Because obviously, you know, Octavian wins the Battle of Actium. But it's not going to be really a slaughter in that sense. It's it's a surrender of of uh the, the army of Egypt in, in 31. Now in 30 AD, we could apply it there. So what do we think about the many shall fall down slain? So when is that? So we got the overflowing, his army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. It, we could, we could just look at that, that phrase and try to see where that leads us. Because um, we got falling down, the fall slain. So let's take a look at this. Could you make one correction, though? What's that? You have Antony's suicide on the 1st of August of 20 BC. Okay, yeah, so just hit the wrong key there. Okay, 30 BC. Okay, so if we look at this, many shall fall down slain. Um, we just kind of cross-reference it. Now, the overflowing we've looked at many times, but falling down slain, we haven't. I'm just going to first look at this and search this, these words. Well, in Ezekiel 30, it talks about when the sword shall fall in Egypt or shall come upon Egypt, or when the slain shall fall in Egypt. And we got fall down slain. But I'm going to look at the Hebrew words themselves. Yeah, I need this one. So, because it's many shall fall down slain. So I need all of those words. And many shall fall down slain. Okay, so the only place we have that exact phrase. So let me get rid of many. Apparently, that doesn't make sense. I did something wrong. I'll do it this way instead. Right. So we don't have, I mean, we could just look, you know, slain um, in different places. Uh, in the fall, it just occurs so many times. 
but it's too many, too many in slain. I know it's going to be lots of times. 76 times. Let me go look it up this way. We'll just deal with fall, fall and slain. So we got that with Egypt, the slain fall in Egypt. Okay, so this lament for Egypt in Ezekiel 30. Word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord God, How ye woe worth the day. For the day is near, even the day of the Lord is near. A cloudy day, it shall be the time of the heathen. And and you can see the word of the heathen there. That's going to be just the goyim, right? And the sword shall come upon Egypt, and great pain shall be in Ethiopia, when the slain shall fall in Egypt. And they shall take away her multitude and her foundations shall be broken down. Ethiopia and Libya and Lydia and all the mingled people and Shub and the men of the land, land that is in league shall fall with them by the sword. Uh, thus saith the Lord, they also that uphold Egypt shall fall in the pride of her power. Ah, oh, yeah. Um, shall come down from the tower of Syene. Shall they fall in it by the sword, saith the Lord God. Okay, so when you look at this uh, pride of her power, what does this remind you of? Israel. Okay, now this is talking about Egypt, but pride of your power, Israel in what sense? Well, wasn't the pride of Israel's power removed? Right, so in Leviticus 26, it's going to say, I will break the pride of her power. That's exactly the same words. Okay. Now, in the context here, I mean, we know that this is going to be about the captivity of Manasseh, right? And and also Hoshea. Now, so we have this in Ezekiel 30, verse 6. We also have another place where it's going to talk about about this. Uh, But they use a different word. It's, it's Ezekiel 7, verse 24. Therefore, I will bring the worst of the heathen, and they shall possess their houses, and I will also make the pomp of the strong to cease. The pomp of the strong is exactly the same words that we see in Ezekiel 30, verse 6, and Leviticus 26, uh, verse 19. Though it's a little bit different form of the word. Instead of as, it's as, but... It's, it's really the same word. So the pride of your power, the pomp of the strong. And in here in this context, it's going to be the, uh, the sanctuaries, their places of worship, the mikdash. Okay, so how can we connect this now? So is this talking, this lament for Egypt, is this talking about what ultimately happens to Egypt in 30 BC? I think it has in connotations with Egypt in Daniel 11, verse 40. 243 as well because yeah. it talks about the day of the Lord yeah so mm-hmm. about, uh, so sort of the clo- after the close of probation that time right now, and, which uh, here is symbolic it, right so we're dealing with literal Egypt here at this point but but it's it's going to be applied as symbolic in our time right yeah yes okay. yeah but, so you can maybe sort of see that, that being typified as well with the fall of Egypt in 31, 30 BC. Okay. Sort of type of, as a, as sort of like a, a triple application of prophecy. Okay. And, and so, and then when we're looking at Ezekiel 30, then is this talking about the destruction of Egypt in 30, 30 BC, 31, 30 BC? Well, I would connect it to what's happening with Babylon. And well, the, uh, so initially, initially, right, so initially we tie it with what's happening with Babylon. So I understand that. But I'm just saying, can it also be applied to the ultimate end of Egypt? I think it could. Okay, All right. So, yeah, because we know this. the context, the immediate context is 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 going to be dealing with Babylon. Because uh, Babylon's going to be given Egypt, but we could say that it, it definitely does apply later on. Now, when it talks here, uh, she'll come down from the Tower of Syene, 
shall they fall in it by the sword. Uh, what is this, this Syene? We looked at this before. From Milgal, yes. Mig to Syene, we talked about that. And that's just kind of like when you say from, like with Israel, you talk about from, um, uh, from Dan Down to, to Bersheba. Bersheba. Yeah, it's kind of like the same thing, right? So this is a total yes. fall of Egypt. Right? From yes. Migdal to Syene. Okay. So, so that could refer then more to 30 AD, ultimately, than just the immediate destruction. And of course, it's, for the day is near, even the day of the Lord is near, a cloudy day, it shall be the time of the heathen or the nations. The sword shall come upon Egypt in great pain shall be in Ethiopia, right? So, they that, also they that uphold Egypt shall fall, right? And this, um, that, that prop it up, Right, that's the idea. And the pride of the power shall come down. So, what would be the pride of power of Egypt? Would that be the Pharaoh? Yes. He... Yeah. And then maybe applying to Cleopatra. Probably. I mean, it would just no, refer I... to the kingship in general, right? And so that's going to end once Rome has conquered Egypt. It well, you have the pride of. Yeah, you had the pride of power being mentioned in Ezekiel in connection to the sanctuary. Yes, I know. Yeah, in seven. So verse. I'm just thinking. Now, now I'm sort of. You can maybe connect it to the king or the queen of Egypt, but also you can maybe connect it to their seven verse. Um, their temple or so forth. Their their prime place of worship. Well, yeah. Well. You could. I mean, the thing is, when it comes to Israel, we have two different applications. One is the pride of the power, and it's seven verse. Which verse is it again? Is it maybe it's verse? Which was the verse where we had pride of her power? Yeah, I'll just go back. Seven twenty-four. That's it. Wherefore I'll bring the worst of the heathen; they shall possess their houses. I'll also make the pomp of the strong to cease. That's the pride of the power, and their holy places shall be defiled. So, um, and do we have another place here where that we can compare it to as well? Well, I think it talks about the sanctuary of strength or. Yeah, here is that. The, no, I, the excellency, the excellency of your strength. Yeah, where is that? that um, I think chapter around 20, 23, around that time. Yeah, so. Just, yeah, just put in the excellency. Can't be excellency. Strength them. Yeah, uh, that's going to be Ezekiel 24. Speak unto the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will profane my sanctuary, the excellency of your strength. I don't know why it didn't show up. Um, so again, that excellency is just going to be the word uh, pride. And the word strength is the same one, Oz, that's translated as power. The desire of your eyes and that which your soul pitieth and your sons and your daughters whom you have left shall fall by the sword. Now, so this also in this context, remember, this is when Ezekiel's wife dies, right? Yes. Okay. And and so he's not to mourn the death of his wife and they are not to mourn the the destruction of the sanctuary. Is that the idea there? You know, and, and Jerusalem. So, because this is a judgment from God. Now, I've got, you know, some people have brought this up as an objection to the pride of the power being the kingship, you know, when they're arguing against the 2520. Right. So they say, well, see here, it's, it's the sanctuary is the pride of their power, but, but they are connected. How are they connected? Why would we, why would we argue, well, the pride of your power in Leviticus 26, uh, and the first seven times is is referring to the captivity of Manasseh, and then here we have the exact same word, um, but it's referring to the sanctuary. Well, I would think um, the sanctuary is about worship of God, who would be the, yeah. the king. He would be the true king of Israel, mm -hmm. of which the king of Israel would be meant to be in some way. A type of if he is a good king. Right. And and so even though this is the pride of your power, the, the word pride here is not necessarily an evil word, 
right? Like the Hebrew word that's translated as pride and excellency, because it actually can mean majesty, right? So it depends where you put your strength in. Do you put your strength in God or do you put it in, in your king apart from God, right? So there is a connection between the kingship and the, and the sanctuary itself, because this king is supposed to represent that connection uh, with God, right? He's supposed to be connected with God. So, so we can see that in, in Egypt as well, whether you're talking about it being like the sanctuary or the king, it's, it's not really, it's not really that different. They're not really different things. They're tied together. Okay. So, so anyway, what we can say is that when they, where was this here? Yeah. So when they shall, uh, many shall fall down slain. What we're saying is that this destruction of Egypt, this battle of Actium and, and the, the end of Egypt are connected to how, how are we connecting these? What is it that we're looking at? Many shall fall down slain. When is that? Can we argue that that is in 30 AD? Now, what about his army overflowing? So we know that overflowing refers to the Sunday law. Here now we're dealing with the history that is the fall of Egypt. Why do we have an overflowing that his army overflows? So that means a complete destruction, right? Or it can mean. This is a type of uh, conquering. So, so I think verse 26 is more referring to what happens in 30 AD, not what happens in 31. So, so the way that they, they're going to do this, uh, they're going to talk about forecasting devices against his strongholds even for a time. So that's a period from 31 AD to 330, uh, 31 BC to 330 AD. And then it goes back and it says, it deals with the Battle of Actium in verse 25 and showing that, that the king of the south will not stand. It's not going to be the one that's going to stand in this prophecy that's going to ultimately be the, the power that crucifies Christ, that fulfills prophecy. So Egypt doesn't become this power. Um, for Rome shall forecast devices against him. That's going to say they shall forecast rather than he shall forecast devices against him where it talks about he shall stir up power and courage against the king of the south. And now it's going to say they shall forecast. So that would bring us to Rome in, in a more general sense. And then they that forty uh, feet of the portion of his meat shall destroy him and his army shall overflow and many shall fall down slain. This is going to refer then after the battle of Actium to the defeat of Egypt in 38. And then it's going to go back. Both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief. That has to do with their ambition, uh, wickedness, right? And they shall speak lies at one table, uh, but shall not prosper. For yet the end shall be at the appointed time. So that's going to be 330. And then when it says, then he shall return into his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant, and he shall do exploits is an added word, um, and return to his own land. At the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. So we have this time appointed at, in verse 27, and we have a time appointed in verse 29. Are they the same time appointed? Can they be the same time appointed? I don't know. Well, because it says the end shall be at the time appointed. In verse 27, that's how it ends. And it says, he shall return into his own land with great riches. His heart shall be against the Holy Covenant, which has to be during that period of, of the time of Christ. And he shall do and return to his own land at the time appointed. Now, we say the time appointed is 330. He shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. Right? So this is going to be you know, what we're going to study, because now we're going to start dealing with with the Roman Empire, or not the Roman, uh, the papacy. With the, so we're going to have the Rome, Rome move its capital uh, from Rome to Constantinople. 
And now we're going to have a new power going to be introduced in this history, right? And we know in verse 30, this is going to be talking about the fall of Rome, right? The Vandals we talked about. And, and this is going to be then this transition from pagan Rome to papal Rome. So, so we have to decide, you know, it talks about the time appointed. The end is at the time appointed. And then it's going to talk about at the time appointed, he shall return and come towards the south. But it's not going to be as the former or as the latter. So what's the former and what's the latter? So that's, those are the things that we're going to have to, to address uh, tomorrow, at least start to address them. But uh, I'm just going to look here at, at dealing with verse 29. So here's, here's what Uriah Smith says. The time appointed is probably the prophetic time of verse 24, which has been previously mentioned. It closed, as already shown, in AD 330, at which time this power was, return, was to return and come again toward the south, but not as on the former occasion when it went uh, to Egypt or as the latter when it went to Judea. Those were expeditions which resulted in conquest and glory. This one led to demoralization and ruin. The removal of the seat of the of empire to Constantinople was the single signal for the downfall of the empire. Rome then lost its prestige. The Western division was exposed to the incursions of foreign enemies. On the death of Constantine, the Roman Empire was divided among his three sons, Constantius, Constantine II, and Constans. Constantine II and Constans quarreled, and the victorious Constans gained the supremacy of the entire West. The barbarians of the north, that's going to be these ships of Kitten, soon began their incursions and extended their conquests until the imperial power of the West expired in AD 476. So this is how we have understood these verses, what it's talking about. So it's going to address this time appointed in verse 27. The end is going to be at the time of the appointed. But in the meantime, Rome's going to return unto his own land with all these riches. They're going to have conquered, you know, the south, Egypt. And then they're also going to be against his heart is also going to be against the Holy Covenant. So this has to do with God's people. And he shall do and return to his own land. At the time appointed, he shall return. Now notice it's going to say he returns to his own land, and then it says at the end of verse 28, he returns to his own land. So we're going to have to consider why does the verse start with, then shall he return to his own land, and why does it end and return to his own land? So we're going to have to consider that. And, and then this interpretation that we've held for a long, long time, at the time appointed here is going to be referring to uh, what happens in 330, at which begins this fall of Rome. And then it's going to lead right into the papacy in verse 31, right? When the daily is taken away and the abomination of desolation is given. And any thoughts on this? We still got about eight minutes, so. <clears throat> Now, at some point, we're going to draw these on a line. For now, we're not. We don't have a line for this drawn out. We're just trying to understand the historical application. Any thoughts? I think uh, Swearingen has a different approach to Uriah Smith mm -hmm. about the former and the latter. Okay. It shall not be as the former, not shall be a latter. So let's check out what he says. Okay. We'll do that. Okay, so at uh, I'll show you this here. So he's looking at Daniel 29 and 30, the ships of Kittim and the triumph of Christianity. So we agree with that, the ships of Kittim. Uh, but at the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former as at the latter. The time appointed, uh, so it says, this passage points out that the Roman Empire, at the time appointed, the end of the 360-year prophecy, would return by coming toward, not to the south, Egypt. This return would not be like the former time when Octavian, the king of the north, conquered Egypt in, three, in 30 BC, or the latter time, the future con conquest of Egypt by the king of the north in Daniel 40, verse 45. 
40 to 45. So that's a different way of looking at the ladder. And that's kind of what I was more thinking, but, but I'm not sure if that's correct. Uh, but peacefully, without the intention of waging war, this passage actually reached its fulfillment when the Emperor Constantine the Great, uh, his reign was from 312 to 337, moved the capital of the Roman Empire from Rome to Constantinople, thus relocating the imperial capital toward Egypt, that is, in the direction of Egypt, but not exactly to Egypt itself, having peaceful intentions. Constantine the Great came to power under an interesting series of events. When the pagan emperor Diocletian came to power, he sought for a way to contain the Germanic invasions along the Roman frontier border that had caused considerable political and economic upheaval. Diocletian believed that these crises could be handled more efficiently by delegating imperial authority, so he created a system of government called the Tetrarchy, this system would divide the empire into two halves, east and west. Two co-emperors called Augusti, uh, Augusti would rule each half, while two Caesars would be appointed as vice-emperors and be the successors of the Augusti. If an emperor were to die or abdicate, the Caesar would move up into the emperorship and appoint a new Caesar to take his place. This reorganization actually proved to control Germanic inv invasions and be quite helpful in maintaining political control of the empire. Okay. So anyway, what do we think about this at this point? How is this differing other than that the latter is referring to Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45? So you've got the latter dealing with the, in a sense, the typical destruction of Egypt, the, the figurative, right, the, the type. And then you have the latter, which is going to be the destruction of Egypt in Daniel 11, verse 40. So this is a different type of event. It's the removal of the capital from, from Rome to Constantinople, which now what about the idea that it's a movement towards the south? Um, I have a hard time understanding that because he says it means towards the south. I guess we could look at this tomorrow. I, I just don't understand how that's towards the south. It doesn't seem very south to me. Okay. Any final thoughts? We'll come back to this tomorrow. Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we ask for your continued guidance throughout this day in our personal study. As we come back to this tomorrow, we ask that you can bless each person who's studying these things and that you can uh, correct us in any errors we may have. Um, we pray for your angels' care and protection for our loved ones and that uh, your spirit can dwell within each one of us. Uh, thank you for this study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.